thank you very much. I'm just going to hook up my laptop here. Because I do a lot of uh, computer security work, I often choose to uh, use my own equipment here so I don't spread any viruses around or do anything that can harm anyone. So uh, one second here. So uh, thank you for the introduction. And boy, uh, I didn't realize I was following David's keynote. This is going to be a pretty tough act to follow. He, he left us with a lot of very thought-provoking uh, ideas as part of the big history and and uh, I have no idea what the, where the music is coming from but I'll assume that someone will look into that <laughs> it's nice it's very calming uh, which is good we, and actually you know if, if there's one thing I do want everybody to take away when I'm done with my talk today it is to uh, uh, don't panic uh, to quote Douglas Adams um, you know, there, there's a lot of things going on out there, but I think one of the reasons I was really excited to come here to speak with you today is, one, I, I usually only get to talk to nerds that do security work. And when we get together, we talk about bits and bytes and binary and all this kind of stuff. And it's purely, it's very clinical, right? It's, it's, like, it's like being in a stain and uh, stainless steel glass surgical room where we are only allowed to talk to one another using computer acronyms and all this kind of stuff. And we rarely ever get to talk about the interaction, or what the real impact of both what it is we're doing, the good guys trying to fight this stuff, and what it is the impact of all of these uh, malicious developments have been in computer security for the last, going on almost 30 years now. And so I was very excited. This is a brand new presentation just for you guys because I, I normally don't get to talk about this stuff. Just to give you a little background about who I am, um, originally I was American. Now I'm Canadian, uh, but I work all around the world. I, I live in Vancouver, Canada. I'm very fortunate. It's a very beautiful place to live. And where I work, we have one of our largest labs in the world. Uh, our, our company does antivirus and encryption, all this kind of stuff. And so you know, if I had to sum up what we do or my job at, at the company in a way, it's, it's to keep the good stuff in and to keep the bad guys out. right? And we do all kinds of things related to that. But I work with three or four hundred people around the world that do a lot of research on what does all this stuff mean? You know, how do these computer viruses work? And what are our vulnerabilities? And what, what do we need to do to protect ourselves as individuals and safely use the internet and both you know, protect our social lives and our economy that we are so dependent on electronic communications for? But also, how do we protect our societies in the bigger picture? How do we protect our governments? Um, these types of things. So, a lot of the information I'm sharing with you today is not necessarily my personal research. I want to give credit to all the guys in Sophos Labs. But in essence, I divide my, my time between working in the labs and doing this type of research um, and writing for our blog. And then the rest of my time I spend talking to folks like you and going to conferences and, and, and meeting other people in our business and producing a podcast. So I kind of go back and forth and back and forth. And I, I spend about a third of my time doing research. And then I spend about two-thirds of my time traveling around the world telling everyone about it. Um, so I'm very tired, but I have a very good, fun job. I want to begin by kind of dividing up what you might already know about computer security or think in your mind about computer security and just carefully define a little bit of what I'm going to talk about so that we all have the same understanding of maybe some of the terms if you're not uh, in computer science or in the security business. Um, as in the introduction, we talked about anonymous. So this is certainly one extremely small area of computer security that gets a very large amount of attention from the global media, right? So we, uh, we, Sony was hacked and all these hacks, you know, a year and a half, two years ago that everybody heard about anonymous. And yet, you know, if we were to look at it mathematically, it's such a small problem that we wouldn't even notice it. Uh, it's, it's, it really isn't a lot. But, um, there's a lot to be said for what Anonymous represents. Anonymous represents a, a, a press-oriented grab at hacking. It's a particular type of hacking that's designed specifically to get your attention. It's not designed necessarily to destroy anything. It's not necessarily designed to steal anything. Uh, it's designed to deliver a political message and get as much attention as it can possibly get. And that's its goals. That's the, you know, the, the purpose, the motive behind why People who participate in Anonymous um, largely choose to do so. The second type of cybercrime that you're probably all familiar with would be motivated by this, right? I mean, this motivates almost everything in the world. But the vast majority of computer viruses, website attacks, all the stuff that's happening around us all the time online, 
well over 99% of it is motivated by financial crime, right? Whether that's stealing a credit card, whether that's stealing data for uh, identity theft, whether that's taking your online gaming account and taking your e-gold and selling it on eBay to somebody else for a video game. Um, there's a lot of different motivators behind it, but that's, that's like the hugest, you know, if I had a pie chart up here, it would just be dominated by this motive, right? It's, it's well over 99% of what we're dealing with out there. And then last but not least, kind of what we're here to talk about today, which is what's being termed cyber war, right? The theft of secrets, espionage, as we all heard about uh, a few years ago with the attack on the Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, you know, just political messages, especially here in, in Asia. I know uh, in the t almost 20 years I've been working in this business, many of the um, political parties uh, in, in different countries in this region have had their websites hacked during elections for people to post messages contrary to a, a politician who may be running for office. Um, I know we, we did an investigation. There was a lot of hacks in Malaysia and Singapore a few years ago that were entirely politically motivated by political parties. So whether you, long, long, you know, put that in the cyber war category, it's a little unclear. But these are the three big areas, right? There's kind of political activists. There's people that are out to steal money or, or in some way cause some sort of mayhem that they can profit from. And then there's governments largely interested in finding out uh, information about their adversaries. So... Um, cyber war, you know, I keep hearing this term a lot, cyber war, huh, good God, what is it good for? No, I'm not going to sing. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have went to the beer party last night. You guys inspired me a little bit, but um, you've probably heard that song, war, right? And, and I, I personally, uh, I have questions about this. I'm, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the term cyber war uh, because largely people aren't being killed, um, you know, this type of thing. When we talk about war, it's a very serious, serious thing. And fortunately, um, most of us have not had to be in a situation, had to fight any wars, because we found some largely stability most places in the world. And I, so I'm a little uncomfortable with calling this war, but I want to kind of, you know, take that apart a little bit. Let's look at the types of things that are happening out there. In essence, we've kind of, you know, got this um, spying on each other thing going on, right? There's some, there's some PR behind things like uh, denial of service attacks, which I know here in Korea there's been a lot of that going on in the last few years, um, largely uh, pointing at the North Korean government. But it's unclear what you know, all that means. But you know, attacking the banks so their websites are unavailable, this type of thing. It's a very public-facing thing. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows about it. But it doesn't actually cause any uh, real harm other than it's drawing attention. And then in the middle here, we've got sabotage. And, and certainly, this is something that's been new to us, right? This may have been going on for a while behind the scenes. Governments are very secretive. But most people heard about this computer virus, Stuxnet, that was discovered in 2010 that was designed to attack Iranian nuclear facilities. And it was alleged that the Americans and the Israelis put this computer virus together. I'm going to talk about that more in a few minutes. But that clearly falls under the, the category of sabotage. And then lastly, your regular good old traditional spying, right? Like we simply want to know what everybody else is up to. Uh, sometimes we're economically motivated. We want to know uh, about the latest uh, military aircraft design and, and, and we want to be able to compete. Other times we simply want to know um, what kind of behind the scenes negotiations one nation may be having with another that could affect uh, our, our status in the world. So, you know, let's look at each one of these things a little bit. Uh, this was one of the, the um, I put in the first category, a PR grab, that starts to bring forward some really confusing questions when we talk about cyber war. Because what, you know, the, the traditional definition would, be, definition would be a nation state attacking another nation state using the internet or using computer code of some sort. And yet we saw during a lot of the Arab Spring stuff, a lot of individuals who were simply inspired, perhaps, by the political rhetoric within their country to lash out and take their own actions for their cause or to deliver a political message. In this case, this is all hacks that were done by a group online called the Syrian Electronic Army. They broke into Twitter accounts of the BBC and all these major news organizations around the world to draw attention to the war in Syria and actually defend the Morsi government uh, in the current conflict that's going on there. And actually, I didn't have time to update this this morning. They hacked two more Twitter accounts over the last two days and did this again. So there's even more examples of, of what they've been up to. And the, the question becomes for us to judge, like, 
a breaking into these accounts and, 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 and using them uh, you know, to deliver a political message, is, is that cyber war? Is, is, is the Syrian, can we hold the Syrian government responsible for what this group did? Because in the background we know that they're, they're inspiring their citizens to go out and take their own action on behalf of the government, yet the government hasn't explicitly provided them a tool, that it's not paying them, um, it's simply encouraging them. And, and, we're, and, and this is one of the problems with the whole, problem, the, the, whole, the whole area of cyber war, which is what can we hold someone accountable for, right? If, if I shoot a gun, I know who shot the gun. There's a bullet, it came out of the gun, I know where the gun was, I, I can say definitively it was this soldier or this army or this nation that chose to fire that weapon or a Scud missile or whatever it might be. But in the cyber realm, it starts getting really, really confusing. Can I say that this is, you know, the Syrian government is responsible for breaking into this? Or are these just independent rogue individuals who are misguided and deciding to partake in this activity? Um, sabotage is a little more clear often. Uh, there's some, been some interesting examples. Before most of you were born, uh, back in the early 1980s, a, a pipeline in Siberia was exploded. And, and it was a secret for almost 30 years. And it just recently came to light in 2010 that the Americans found out that the Russians had a spy within uh, uh, the, the, the American government looking for control systems for, for managing the Siberian pipeline. They wanted to increase the capacity and they didn't have the ability and the, the science yet to manage and control the flows of oil and manage the temperatures and understand all these different things. So they started planting spies within American companies uh, to uh, uh, steal the technology, right? Traditional spy espionage, not computer espionage, but they wanted that computer code that could control these valves and temperature sensors and all this kind of stuff. And um, somebody in the Canadian consulate actually found out that the Russians had planted these spies and informed the Americans that this company and this company have a Russian spy that's trying to steal your technology. So they intentionally altered their own products to fail so that when they stole them and replicated them, they'd create faulty products that resulted in the, uh, in the Siberian pipeline exploding. It's probably the first true example of cyber war or, or computer-based sabotage uh, in, our, in our history. And of course, the Americans were very good at keeping that secret until somebody leaked it in 2010. Of course, the Soviet Union's long gone now. I think bygones can be bygones. But uh, I, I found it interesting because I think this probably is going on much more than we understand. There's a lot of this activity out there. Most of us won't ever be exposed to it unless we um, so, you know, serve our governments and, and, and participate in secret programs. But it has been going on for a very long time and there's no reason to believe that that hasn't been continuing on all the time since 1982 when this happened. Um, the, the, we have every reason to believe it's happening consistently and all the time. Now, there were some reports on American television in the last year about blackouts in Brazil being caused by cyber attackers. And I, used, I put this one up here as a, as a warning. As a good scientist, you need to question everything. You need to say, who, who's motivated to tell me this story and what, you know, why might they want to tell me a story that might not be true? And I think probably at least half of what we read about computer viruses and cyber attacks and all this stuff is very poorly reported by the press. Uh, they, they find something that sounds very sexy and entertaining and then they present that because they know that people like to read those stories. And more often than not, I, mean, I have a great respect for Kevin Polson who wrote this story that's at the top of the slide there. I actually talked to him this morning for a, a story <laughs> similar to what we're talking about today. But you know, he reported the story and it turns out you can see the blue link there. Brazilian blackout traced to sooty insulators, not hackers. Uh, the blackouts, you know, there was a maintenance problem at the power plant, but it was blamed on hackers. Anytime something goes wrong and if there can be a political, if something goes wrong in India, it was Pakistan. If something goes wrong in Israel, it was Palestine. If something goes wrong, you know, you understand that the, the media often wants to tell that story. And then this, I thought, was a, a fascinating topic that came up on the American, uh, if, you're a, a, if you're a computer nerd, you may be familiar with Slashdot. It's a very popular American online magazine. And they were asking the questions, you know, if, if we really are having cyber war, would the guys who wrote the computer virus to attack the Iranian nuclear facilities, are they now soldiers? Can we invade and go kill them? Would that be a legal act to retaliate kinetically with physical force to an, to an online attack? And, you know, clearly there's no answer to that question, but it is something we have to consider. Like, if we're going to call this war, then these are the types of consequences we have to uh, put along with that, because war is not something to be toyed with. 
So the other, uh, the final category of what's going on out there, I put under spying, SIGINT, and IP theft, uh, you know, the, the information war as opposed to the sabotage. We're stealing stuff and we're learning stuff, but we're not disrupting stuff and we're not blowing things up, we're not killing anyone, we're not harming systems. We're simply looking around. So if, uh, SIGINT means signals intelligence if you haven't served in the army yet. And uh, signals intelligence is the traditional way. If we think about signals intelligence over the last 100 years, this is what we would think of, right? Guys with a big antenna, they're, they're gonna spy on enemy communications. Maybe you've got guys at the NSA, you know, intercepting satellite communications, trying to, to break down what Gorbachev is going to do next in the Cold War, this type of thing, right? That's signals intelligence. But signals intelligence is much more about this now than it is about that, right? Like today, signals intelligence is about the internet. And all of us have been hearing about the work that the NSA has been doing that's caused so much uh, controversy in the United States with, with uh, you know, all the, all the uh, intercepting everyone's internet communications, uh, allegedly intercepting everyone's internet communications, all this kind of stuff. And you know, we're, we don't have to do, I mean, we probably still do some of that, but the reality is it's about this, right? It's about the bytes, it's about capturing passwords and access codes and determining what people are doing through electronic means. And this, you know, I don't think there are, I'm asking a lot of questions, but I don't think there are answers to any of this. Is this better or is this worse than what we used to do? Uh, what, what, is the, you know, what is the impact on us? And, what we know, we know what the political and military impacts are largely already, right? Because that's the reason, you know, the Americans wanted to disrupt the Iranian nuclear program without dropping a bomb. That seems like a noble thing. Most of us would agree that dropping a bomb is a far worse way to solve a problem than to maybe go in and hack a computer and turn something off, right? It seems on the surface to be a very politically uh, good answer to a problem. And the real question is, you know, do these things work, right? So if we go and take this new approach and we start writing these computer viruses and governments build these giant cyber armies, is this something that can truly be effective compared to the traditional way of either working it out through an organization like the UN or going in with guns a-blazing? And, uh, you know, of course, this is Ahmadinejad walking through this uh, uh, Natanz plant in, in Iran and, um, it's clear that this Stuxnet virus, which was out there for about two and a half years attacking this facility, uh, had an impact. Um, at, at the time, production capacity of the centrifuges in Iran was down 40% during the active period of this computer worm working. So it was a disruption. It didn't stop it, but it was a disruption to the ability for the Iranians to develop a weapon. But what we maybe didn't really think about was what, what would Iran's reaction be whether they knew it was a virus or not. So Iran didn't know what was, obviously if they knew it was a computer virus, they'd turn all the computers off and everything would get better. <laughs> so they didn't know that. But even not knowing that they were being attacked or not understanding why they were having problems, all they cared about was how much nuclear material for making a weapon that they could get so they could get to their eventual goal. So what did they do? They doubled the number of centrifuges. So they actually ended up with more capacity producing after the virus attack than they had before. Now, we don't know whether they would have done that had they not been attacked, but that's one of those open questions. Did we actually cause them to get to their goal more quickly by doing this attack than had we just left them alone to begin with? Did, did we really achieve our goals? And, you know, there's a lot more uh, information. There's some really great stories, uh, if you're interested in that, uh, the development of kind of that, that political side to those types of things. The BBC has some really good write-ups um, uh, on that situation. So what are the outcomes from using these technologies, right? One of the outcomes we're seeing is we're seeing criminals use the things that are being developed by our governments against ourselves. So we saw there was actually an attack in Iraq that killed several American forces, uh, for, uh, service members, uh, that resulted from people taking pictures of the base where they were working and sending, putting them on Facebook for their loved ones while they were at war with the location tagging on on their iPhone or their Android. It never came out. I just used an iPhone screenshot because it was handy. I'm not blaming Apple. Um, but, you know, think about that, right? Uh, suddenly, you know, you're, you're disclosing a secret location of a military operation by sharing a photo with your, with your mom. That's not something people think about, but it's something that's being turned. We, we know that 
that Western governments have been using this geo-tracking data for a lot of uh, uh, espionage and spying for years, but it's being turned against ourselves. Everybody, once you have a technology, everybody has it, right? So the rebel on the ground in Iraq who wants to place an IED on the bomb route has the same technology you and I have. We all, we're, this is a very level playing field. The government may have an advantage in money and number of people to throw at a given problem, but any terrorist or activist or anyone, whether it's anonymous or whether it's someone wanting uh, to, to attack a military operation, has ultimately almost the same technology and resources available to them as a full-on nation state. This is a piece, of, this is a very popular virus that uh, I noticed, actually you folks are very lucky that live here in South Korea for, from this particular malware, because I was going to use a screenshot of one that, that, that targets you, and you're one of the few countries in the world for some reason these criminals aren't targeting. So you're very fortunate. Uh, this ransomware is in about 40 some countries now that says that your computer has been uh, locked down because you've, been a, you've downloaded an illegal mu music or movie file and you're being fined by the American government, a uh, hundred dollar fine, and it's all a hoax. It's all, you know, it's just another computer virus. There's nothing real about it, but they've tailored it to many different countries. So if you're in Poland, it's Polish, and if you're in Canada, it's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And if you're in America, it's the FBI, right? And, and it's very convincing to a lot of people. But what's interesting to me is they're borrowing techniques that our governments are actually using as part of their ruse. They're taking the ideas. So this particular one, that little gray box there, I, keep, I shouldn't turn around when I'm presenting. When you guys present, don't do what I've been doing. Um, I just can't see very well on my little screen here. Um, but the, uh, uh, that gray box there, that's actually turned on your webcam. And we've seen the Estonian government, we've seen the American government, and we've seen others actually, to determine who's attacking them, attack someone's laptop and turn on their webcam and look at the criminal on the other side to see who they might be. And now everyday garden variety Russian criminals that are behind these attacks that are trying to simply make money are adapting that tactic as part of their social engineering to trick people into believing that they're actually the government. In America, we have a very famous saying, trust me, I'm with the government. I mean, that means exactly the opposite. Um, Iran's reaction was interesting. Um, that there is General William Shelton. He is the four-star general in the American Air Force Space Command, which I believe has now been renamed the Cyber Command. Uh, general Shelton was uh, quoted about the Iran situation saying that um, he regretted whoever had made the attacks because the Iranians have doubled their investment in every single thing related to what they were trying to stop. They doubled their ability to produce nuclear material for a weapon. They've doubled down on the defense of their computer networks, the separation of them. It's disrupted other spying activities that we had where we were getting intelligence about what Iran was doing. All of these things were a result of unleashing that virus. And he, without saying it in so many words, because he probably didn't want to lose his job, was questioning the, the forethought of taking that action without considering all the consequences of deploying that malware. I mentioned earlier, you guys have had some things here. Shinhan Bank uh, had a virus outbreak that caused a, a big disruption to their ability to, to deliver services. YTN fell to the same, the same virus attack. Uh, we saw Sony both infected and in denial of service attacks and all these sort of, sorts of things against Sony's online PlayStation gaming empire. Um, and of course, there were rumors about uh, um, attacks on Georgia, the, 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 the country just south of Russia that's had a dispute over some territory with the Russians um, being involved in a cyber attack. And of course, here in Korea, the, the, the attacks on Shinhan Bank and YTN were blamed on the north. Uh, in Estonia, we blamed the Russians. And in Sony, we blamed Anonymous. And the question is, what is the truth to any of these things, right? What, what evidence do we have to believe this? You know, you start looking into the situation in Georgia and we end up looking like we're back to the Syrian electronic army I had up there where they hacked all those Twitter accounts, right? There was no direct connection to the Russian government. They may have been encouraged, but Russian activists have been attacking Georgia for years online. That's a constant activity. And, and Georgia, three days before these attacks, had made an advanced movement against the Russian-claimed territory, and immediately the attacks spiked on the internet. Is that the Russian government? Is that cyber war? Did they go and instruct Russian cyber soldiers to attack Georgia? 
Or was it patriotic Russian citizens who are good hackers who went, those bastards, I'm gonna get them. Let's all go attack. Let's, you know, and rallied everybody together on a chat channel on the internet and said, charge, right? We don't know. We can't tell. There were accusations against a Russian official that he funded some people. There was a denial. You know, what, what's the truth? Don't take things at face value for what you hear in the press because you need to question these things because decisions being made about these types of things are changing our world. We're changing the way we behave, we're changing where we invest our money, we're changing our politics based on alleged activities of enemies that can't be proven. And, and to use the, 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 you know, Dark Soul was the attack against the bank and the TV station here in, in South Korea. Uh, this was a, a screen that was put up by the attackers, uh, who is who is. It's a little uh, awkward. Um, unfortunately, we've deleted your data. We'll be back soon. Over here, we've got the, 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 the they, when they erased your computer, it wouldn't boot, which is what disrupted the TV network and the bank. Their computers, when they got these viruses, had the, the uh, ability to, to start up disrupted, and they weren't able to start their computers, and everything was deleted. But, I mean, to me, that doesn't re really look like something that necessarily a government would put together if they were attacking a TV station, right? Maybe this is um, state-sponsored patriotism that, in, in, that motivates individuals to take action. And then that, so much of what we see online is that. The question is now, what is, if it's being encouraged by the government, can we hold them accountable? Can we say, if the North Koreans are encouraging this activity, that's an attack on our systems, we're going to hold you, the North Korean government, responsible for everyone in your country uh, that may have decided to do this over the internet. Uh, and, and you know, th these questions are, are difficult because uh, obviously nations don't control all their people, but at the same time, we're seeing um, this pattern repeating over and over and over again. The Iranians are using this technique, the North Koreans are using this technique. Um, it's been accused the Americans are using this technique. We, we've certainly seen this uh, being used commonly in, in the, the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, there's been lots and lots of this, we'll give you some money, we'll give you some state support, but you don't work for us, so if something happens, you can't blame our government. Um, IP theft is the big topic in the Americas when it comes to cyber war. Everybody's blaming China for stealing all of their secrets. And there may be some truth to some of that. I, I thought this was interesting here. This is a, 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 a computer board that goes into a router that runs the internet. Um, and the, the one there on the right is manufactured by Cisco, the very, very popular computer router manufacturer. And the one there on the left is a counterfeit from China. Now, it would be hard to deny that clearly does the design of this one was stolen from the company that produced that one. They're, they're, they're so functionally identical that it, it took someone to do a six-month forensic analysis to determine what the difference was so they could warn people not to buy the counterfeit ones. So I think you know, sometimes IP theft is pretty, pretty cut and dry. Uh, this was, here's a fake Apple store that was in China. Like they actually set up real stores that looked like Apple stores that were selling counterfeit Apple products. And I mean, so you know, IP theft is another component of this alleged war, because now we're not talking about nuclear weapons, now we're talking about economic war, right? Uh, you know, Cisco is harmed by somebody producing a fake thing with their brand on it. They put all the engineering and effort and science into developing this amazing technology, and somebody's stole that. So that, that, that's kind of the, I think, for, I, I consider that, if we're going to call this stuff cyber war, I consider this part of it, uh, because uh, economic war is often more powerful than, than kinetic war. Um, when, you know, if we look at the Soviet Union's failure, it wasn't because we blew them up with bombs and weapons and guns. We, we made them go bankrupt. Um, and I'm sure my Russian historian friend here will disagree with me. I, I'm sure I've got some of that wrong. Uh, but uh, that's how, I, you know, how we perceive it largely. We ended the war economically. We didn't end the war uh, with kinetic explosive weapons. And so what are these unintended consequences that I mentioned as the lead for my talk with you today. Um, does, does anybody want to tell me what the difference is between that and this when we unleash a new weapon on the world? Does anybody have any feedback? No physical harm, no physical harm right? That, that's certainly one aspect. We, well, I mean, 
We can't say for sure because uh, computer code could cause things to go haywire that could hurt someone. But it largely hasn't, right? It seems safe, comparatively. Obviously, compared to something as horrific as, as that, uh, it's, it's much safer. Yes, sir? More control over this? More control over this. So you think this is more precise? Uh, true, yeah, absolutely, right? Because, I mean, that didn't care if you were a man, woman, or child. Uh, cost of the operation? That's, um, that's, an, that's debatable. Uh, the, the cost of, of developing an entire large scientific community to build cyber weapons could be compared to things on the order of the Manhattan Project, but that's an interesting point. Yes, ma'am? This side spreads more. Yeah, and, and why, I guess the question might be why. This, this, if this represents Stuxnet, the, 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 the virus that went against the Iranians, it spread more, but its spread was very controlled. You know, the, the computer code was designed not to go rampant and hurt everyone. It was designed to try to stay in a particular area. I think what strikes me the most is that when this happened, our adversary in that war did not get the technology that we used, right? When we use a physical weapon, if I shoot you with a gun, you don't have the ability to make that gun. If I drop this bomb, after the war, the Japanese didn't get the atomic bomb because we dropped it. It's not like they suddenly had the ability to now use that weapon themselves. Because of the finiteness of that weapon, it ended the whole thing. It just stopped right there. This weapon, as soon as I use it as a government, Everybody on planet Earth that has a computer has the technology that I had to develop that weapon. Everyone can use that technology in that state-sponsored research to harm everyone else in a way that's never been seen in, in physical war. And when we look at, I, I wanted to describe something before I, I, I finish my talk. Um, we use a term a lot in computer virus stuff of zero day, a zero day attack, zero day this, zero day that. What is zero day? And, and the concept basically is the, the day zero is the day at which you can protect yourself against a known threat. So this was one of the, the cyber weapon attack timelines of, of a new computer flaw that was being exploited by a computer virus to, to do spying on another country. And the first ever mention of it we could find on the internet was March 16th. There was a Chinese hacker forum where guys were talking about this bug in Windows that they had found. And May 24th, it was posted, some computer code was posted that on a secret forum somewhere where people could then utilize that bug to cause harm to a computer. And then on June 12th, it took till June 12th, so three months almost, before Microsoft discovered that there was a bug in Windows that, that could be exploited by a computer virus and, and posted a, a fix. So this is day zero. That's the day at which if you use Windows on your computer, you could get the fix from Microsoft and be protected against this new attack method. What this doesn't show is that not only does this go back to March, actually, it turns out this bug was used two years before that. It was discovered by a government, and it had been actively used for two and a half years before you could even protect yourself. So the biggest fear companies have and computer uh, experts have about our computers is protecting against these unknown problems, right? Because once the fix is out from Microsoft, you can apply it to your computer or Apple or whichever company is out there. But the really valuable ones, if you want to secretly spy and infect people's computer with malware, you want something that no one knows about. So the further back this goes, the more valuable that flaw is. The longer you can have a secret bug that you can use to attack people, the more value that has in the underground. And that's where I come back to Stuxnet. Um, it's pretty clear now that the Americans and the Israelis developed this code. It has been for a long time, but it, it, now that the Obama administration is actually prosecuting people for leaking the story, it's kind of obvious that it's true. Um, and it had four of these zero-day vulnerabilities in it, four of them. Um, now, Stuxnet had been in the wild for two and a half years attacking the Iranians, and nobody knew about any of those. And the day that we dis, you know, it was discovered by the scientific community that this virus was out there, we all wrote stories about it. Oh, there's, you know, there's some kind of virus attacking Iranian nuclear plants, and you know, the press went wild, right? Within eight hours, criminals were using those 
exploits to deliver malicious code to steal your credit cards, to steal your identity. Uh, within the first month, we had detected somewhere around 2 million computers were infected using United States government developed exploits. Right? That's, in my opinion, uh, some of this unintended consequence. Did the men in the Pentagon in, in Washington, D.C., sitting around the table saying, we want to use this virus to attack the Iranians and nobody's going to die and it's a much better solution than all of our other options out there. Did they consider the two million people in the first month after its discovery that might be infected by a computer virus and cause them harm? Did they consider all the other knock-on effects of what taking these seemingly, I mean, you know, computer code's a mystery, right? If you're a four-star general, you typically don't know a lot about computer science. And so when I come to you and I say, I've got this com fantastic computer weapon and it fits on a thumb drive in your pocket and it can blow up nuclear plants, it sounds pretty good. And, and, and I, I question, um, I think these are the things we need to think about when we, one, I think we need to um, approach the term cyber war or online cyber attacks with more gravity than we have. There's a lot at stake here and there could be lives at risk and this isn't a joke. Um, and two, we need to question a lot more of, of what's, uh, what are the unintended impacts that can spread from these types of problems. And I just want to give you a brief, I'm going to do a really short demo and then I'll do q and I just want to show you one of these uh, pieces of malware that uh, take control of your webcam and turn on your microphone and all this kind of stuff that they've borrowed from this government spyware uh, that we've heard so much about. So one second here. I managed to capture one of these FBI ones and watch it there. So this is what it looks like when they infect your computer. Um, this, they, you get this lock, your computer screen locks and they're using this webcam as part of their social engineering. And, and actually, uh, a part of the code in, in these, uh, um, these computer viruses that we see using this appear to be derivative from what we call rats, which are remote access trojans, things that are designed to spy on people. They're being used for espionage more than they're being used for other things. But once that code was out there, once we discovered a rat and we saw how it was using your webcam to spy on you and we saw the computer code behind it, all bets were off. Anybody could do that now, right? It, it, the idea has escaped the lab. And, and, and it's out there for everyone to use. And so this, this is just an example. There's a lot of clever things about this, actually. When they steal your money, they're so worried that another criminal might have a, a key logger on your computer that they make you use a virtual keyboard to enter in the numbers so that other criminals can't uh, take your money before they do. Um, they're, they're, there's a lot of things behind these things. But um, it's just one example of some of that trickle down of government technology um, in a way that's sort of the opposite of the very um, inspiring talk that David gave us about you know, some of the amazing things about tying the world all together. And I was thinking about NASA when you had all these pictures from NASA on the screen and thinking about the amazing things that NASA did to get us into space that have all influenced our lives in a positive way, right? And I, I look at these things as being potentially the other side of that coin that we need to be careful with when we're developing scientific solutions to human problems. Uh, so thank you very much for your attentiveness and your time and, your, and, and participating in my little question in the middle there. I think everybody had really good ideas. Uh, and I have time for some questions, I believe. I got five minutes or so. Are there any questions? Down here? We have a, I think we have a mic coming down. But. The news are there, and you know, what do you think about this? I don't know, what do you think? Do you think that's the truth? Do you I think it was planted? Know. It's hard to know, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean... I mean being a Korean, you know, when I first heard that that happened to North Korea, I was like, yeah, in your face. <laughs> you know? I was like, that. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm South Korean, and if we can't hack into theirs, and we need it, the anonymous to, like, and then it's, they did it, right? What would happen to us when they attack? Yeah, well, and I, I think what my personal opinion about my own 
talk. My conclusions that I'm coming to after researching this and working on this for a long time is um, those of us that aren't in government service at least, I think our jobs are to figure out how to better secure, I mean, developing attacks is always equal, easier than defending. Uh, at a lot of hacker, I was at a hacker conference last week in Las Vegas and one of the contests there is a competition called Capture the Flag. And the idea is you have to hack into the other team's servers, steal their information and take it back, and then you win the, 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 you know, the prize. And there's points for what kind of stuff you steal and all these different things, right? And everybody always wants to be the attacker, and nobody wants to be the defender. It's very easy to come up with new ways of breaking things. It's very difficult to fix them. And I want you folks to be inspired to help us fix them. We have to build better defenses. Our, our global economy is dependent on this stuff working. We can't afford for an anonymous attack that's accidentally attributed to a government to disrupt the entire global economy. You know, we, can't, we can't risk that. But we're in a very fragile position right now where that is a real risk. Like societally, the way we communicate and economically, the way we conduct our transactions is dependent on this very fragile network. And, and for those of you who haven't studied computer science and kind of the development of the internet, if we go back to the 1970s when everything that we're using today was designed, it was a trusted environment. Why have a password? Why have security? It's just us academics talking to one another. We don't need any of that stuff. We all trust one another. We're all upstanding citizens of the world and trying to share our academic knowledge. There was never any understanding that you were going to have a computer in your pocket that could do billions of things per second or that random people all over the world would have access to that. So we've got this very fragile base that we're all very dependent upon. And I would love to see a lot more work being done on build, being better defenders because it's, uh, it's harder work and it's more important to our society than necessarily finding new ways to attack things. And I hope, I hope that, um, I hope those examples, I mean, because one, you gotta be careful what you trust. Like, is it true that those celebrities or politicians were truly in that database or was that a, another political move? But in addition to that, um, the, the, the ability, the ease with which you can break into all these things and the reason we're hearing about it so often is it's that easy. We need to work a lot harder on uh, coming up with smarter defenses. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. It's a very difficult question. So, yeah, I mean, Edward Snowden's an interesting situation because I, I find the American reaction to it uh, partly as a result of one of the worst military plans I've ever heard of. If you talk to anyone who's ever served in, in the military arm of their government, you'll learn that with any plan, if we take the plan, for example, when the Americans went to capture uh, bin Laden, there were nine different contingencies built into the plan. What if this goes wrong, what will we do? What if that goes wrong, what will we do? And in fact, they needed that. You know, a helicopter crashed and they had a plan. They, they all got out, they managed to do it. How on earth did this military operation, this spying operation, I think it's very embarrassing to the American Department of Defense uh, that there was no contingency plan for what happened when a guy decided to leak the information, right? They have no plan. Obviously they have no plan because they didn't they have any idea how to respond to it. And I think that's part of trying to you know, discredit him in the public uh, uh, is, is the only plan they could come up with in a few minutes uh, um, you know, to react to that. So I, I mean, it, I think uh, all the governments of the world should have already known that the Americans were spying on them on using telecommunications as, I mean, we, we know that every major government has a cyber division and arm and we're all actively using it to spy on one another. And, and I think it would be foolish to assume that um, anyone's government wasn't aware that the Americans were doing their best to spy on their communications. And I actually was surprised when uh, part of that story was, uh, I guess, that uh, some people that were at a UN meeting were having their emails intercepted or something at their hotel. And I'm going, if you're a diplomat and you're in the United States for a diplomatic meeting and you're not encrypting your email, you're an idiot. 
I mean, you have to assume you're being spied upon when you're using someone else's communications network and it's to their advantage to know what you're communicating. So I don't think any of these things were necessarily really secrets to governments. They were secrets to us. And so now this is a, a public relations mess that the Americans are trying to figure out how to deal with, right? Um, because if the, if, the, if the noise gets loud enough, they may be disrupted from being able to continue to, to conduct their spying. I mean, the, you know, the, the politicians may get involved, but I guess this is a, I was going to say that that's not scientific. Let's stay to the science, except that we're supposed to be here to talk about the humanities too. <laughs> but I, I don't really have any other opinions on it other than I, I, I've been saying that that kind of stuff was going on for years and people said I was crazy and paranoid. And now I'm like, look, look, I was right. They have been spying on us. I wasn't paranoid. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, that, that's something, you know, if you're concerned about your privacy, um, you have to assume that anything you put on the internet has been intercepted by someone. And so you need to take personal responsibility for deciding what information you share with things, with, with, with individuals uh, online. And if you need it to be private, you probably should um, have a coffee or go to beer night. That's a tough question. I mean, uh, the, 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 my personal opinion is that it's better for for what the American government and the American people believe about the openness of their government, that it's better that people know than not. Um, however, uh, it, it is going to have you know, negative political consequences that I don't know that were necessary. It's, it's a very diff that's an extremely difficult question. Um, personally, I'm kind of glad. I think, I think it's better that it's out in the open. I think that um, there were people that knew all along and that for everyone to understand this is important, and I think it's important for it to be a public discussion about it, certainly within the United States, but I mean it's turning into a global discussion about, you know, the Americans say they're doing it to stop terrorism, and it's hard to argue that stopping terrorism is a bad thing. Um, but on the other side of that, uh, as an American myself, we do have a very basic premise of our, our right to not be spied upon and our right to privacy and all these things, and people are very upset about it. So I think rather than deciding if it was good or bad, it has sparked a public discussion and I'm a fan of that. I'm glad we're having a conversation now about whether this is good or bad and how we all feel about it. Um, whether what Mr. Snowden did was the right way to have that conversation is a different question. Thank you. Any others or are we out of time or? Up there we have one maybe last question. Or are we? Oh. So you know the last question for <laughs> 